after each section. You should play the recording right through without stopping. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers on the listening question pages. At the end of the real IELTS test, you'll be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers from the question booklet to an answer sheet. You should be prepared to do this with the practice test. Here a student called Joanna, telling her friend about an arts festival, which is being held in the city where they are studying. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 and 2. You will see that there is also an example which has been done for you. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 and 2. Hi, Joanna. Where have you been? Hi, Dave. I had to go into college to return a DVD I'd borrowed from the library. Oh, right. But while I was there, I got some information about the City Arts Festival that starts next week. Oh, yeah. I saw a poster advertising it somewhere. Yeah. And I picked up this leaflet from the library. It gives you the website address. So as I was there, I logged on to get more information. Actually, although they've got the full programme of events fixed now, you can't book online, which seems strange. There's a number to phone, though. Hmm. And are there student discounts? I guess so, but I didn't notice. Anyway, there are three things I'd like to see. An Italian film, a rock concert and an art exhibition. Oh. <laughs> the exhibition's free and you don't need to book, so I'll definitely go to that. But I'm going to get tickets for the film in case they sell out. Mm, good idea. You can always buy concert tickets at the door, because that's in a really big hall. Right. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to read questions 3 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 3 to 10. So, when does the festival actually start? Well, it's usually held the first week of October, but it's earlier this year for some reason. The opening night is September the 20th, and events go on till the end of the month. Hmm. And have you got that phone number? Yeah, it's here. Uh, look, it's 0967 990 776. OK, I'll write it down. 0967 990 776. Thanks. I thought the local council made a profit from the festival, but it says here that there's a commercial sponsor. It's a local bank. I didn't know that. Neither did I. What other events have they got on? Um, as well as the art exhibitions and stuff that's open every day, there are special events each day. Like on Monday, there's a musical in the City Hall. Yeah. That's only £3.65 for students. Mm, 
I think I'll give that a miss. I've got football training on Mondays, but I'm free on Wednesday. There's a jazz band on then, and that's only two pounds fifty for students. Sounds good. Is that in the city hall too? We could go. Well, I'm busy actually, but it's at the sports centre if you're interested. Oh, right. Thursday's the cheapest event, only one pound twenty-five for students, and it's on in the library. Can you guess what it is? <laughs> Probably the college choir. <laughs> actually, no, they've not been asked. Apparently. Oh. No, it's a poetry evening. Hmm. Isn't there any modern dance on anywhere? On Friday, that's at the college. It's quite expensive though, fifteen pounds for adults and twelve pounds seventy-five for students. Oh yes, that is a lot. If I'm going to spend that much, I'd prefer to go out on Saturday. Yeah, me too. But on Saturday night there isn't live music or a party or anything, just the fireworks in the city park, and that's only one pound fifty. Yeah, that'd be good. Now turn to section two, on page one hundred and one of your book. You will hear some information about a medical museum in London, called the Hunterian Museum, which is part of the Royal College of Surgeons. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Now listen, and answer questions eleven to fifteen. Good evening. I'm here to tell you about the Hunterian Museum in London, which is part of the Royal College of Surgeons. Although a medical museum, it is open to the general public. The museum specialises in the history of the study of anatomy, and especially the work of John Hunter. In the eighteenth century, if you would like a free guided tour of the museum, then come along at one o'clock any Wednesday. Spaces on the tour are limited to twenty-five, though, so it's best to reserve a place by phone. And these tours are for individual members of the public, families, and small groups of friends only. Tours for groups of school students can also be arranged, and these are also free of charge. Teachers are encouraged to make a donation of around three pounds per student if they can afford it, but this isn't obligatory. What teachers must do, however, is phone to agree a time in advance, as only one school party is allowed in at a time. Then there's an online booking form which you can use to confirm the booking, or just send a letter if you prefer. For older students and adult groups, we provide more specialised tours, and these cost a hundred pounds for a short tour of thirty minutes, or if you want a slightly longer one, it's a hundred and thirty pounds for forty-five minutes. There is a student discount, however, so college groups would pay seventy-five pounds for the shorter tour, for example. In terms of facilities available at the museum, teachers and others should bear in mind that space is very limited. As we're in the centre of London, with many cafes and restaurants nearby, refreshments aren't sold on site. Though there is a small shop selling souvenirs, most of the things on show in the museum are preserved animal specimens in glass cases, so there are no interactive displays aimed at small children. And our tours are only in English, 
although there is printed material available in other major languages on request. There's also a lecture room, which groups can book for an extra charge, and this is equipped with PowerPoint projector and microscopes. Before you hear the rest of the presentation, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Next, a bit about the history of the museum and the preserved animal and plant specimens you can see there. The museum's named after John Hunter, who was a pioneer in the study of anatomy. He was among the first to understand that the study of other animals could tell us a lot about how the human body works. John Hunter was born in 1728 and came to London to work as an assistant in an anatomy school in 1748. Here John did his training in the study of human anatomy. It was after 1760, however, that he turned his attention to animals. That's when he became a surgeon in the army, spending three years in France and Portugal, where he started collecting and preserving animal specimens, such as lizards. On his return to London in 1763, Hunter set up in private practice and started to build up his collection of specimens. When he moved to a big house in Leicester Square in 1783, Hunter started to take in resident students and gave the name Teaching Museum to his collection. By the time of his death in 1793, Hunter had collected specimens from all over the world, including the first kangaroo to be seen outside Australia. He had 14,000 different exhibits, with 500 species of plants and animals represented. And many of these specimens can still be seen in the museum today, because in 1799 the collection was purchased by the government, who presented it to the Royal College of Surgeons. And they've been looking after it ever since, which is why the Hunterian Museum is located in their building in London to this day. Now turn to section 3 on page 102 of your book. You will hear a student called Sarah talking to her college tutor about some research she has to do as part of her course. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 27. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 27. Hello, Sarah. Hi. So, you want to talk about your research project? That's right. I want to find out how many people use the Tourist Information Office and what they think of the service they get. Interesting. Have you written your proposal yet? No, that's what I wanted to ask you about. What should I include? Someone said I should make a list of my aims first. Well, I don't know about a list. A statement of aims is the correct term. It's just a quick summary of what you hope to get out of the project. OK. And should I include other documents I've prepared? 
like the questionnaire. I I'm still working on that. I can check that later, but I think it's good to prepare an information sheet for participants. It would help you to think about interview methods. It'd be good to see that soon. Oh right, and I want the project to have statistical data, not just to be a collection of opinions. That's good. So that should be clear from the proposal too. Great. So what else must I include in the proposal, or are some things optional? Okay, some things that people normally put in a research proposal don't really apply to you, like any costs involved. That can be really important in some research projects, but as we don't have a budget, it's not something you need to include. Any costs have to come out of your own pocket, I'm afraid. Yes, I understand that. But I do need to know your criteria for choosing who to interview. I've got to check that you're using good sampling principles, for example. Sure. And what about the way I'm going to analyse my findings? That's not essential at the proposal stage on this project, but if you've got some ideas, include them because it could save time later. Okay. And do I need to make it clear how the report will be organised? Oh, I'm going to be giving you a template to use, so there's no need to go into that in the proposal. Great, thanks. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-eight to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-eight to thirty. Actually, another thing we could discuss now is making sound recordings of interviews. Oh right! Do I have to record them all? I could try to get as many as possible, but it'd be rather expensive. Yes, don't worry. You only need a few chosen randomly just to give an idea of how the interviews are going. You can send one in each time you update me on your progress. Okay. How often should I do that? I haven't done a timetable for the interviews yet, but they'll be spread over three or four weeks, with about two hundred in total. I reckon on doing twenty a day. Hmm. Let me know how you're getting on at the end of each day's interviewing. Then, whether you've had any problems or not, it can be a lonely job. Thanks. I appreciate that. And what about the confidentiality of participants? Because that can cause problems. Well, I'm getting them to sign a consent form. It says that I'll only use the information for my research, that I won't pass it on to anyone else. But that's the only promise I'm making. They have to give me their names and agree to their data being stored on the college computer network. That sounds good. You won't put names in your report, I know, and the data will all get deleted at the end of the year. But we don't promise any of that. Sure. Now turn to section four on page one hundred and three of your book. You will hear part of a lecture about the wildlife on Christmas Island in the Pacific Ocean. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one. To Now listen, and answer questions thirty-one to thirty-five. Good evening. Tonight I'm talking about Christmas Island in the Pacific Ocean and its incredible wildlife. First of all, 
Let me explain that Christmas Island is a remote tropical island about 2,600 kilometers northwest of Australia, covering an area of 135 square kilometers with 73 kilometers of coastline. Around 85 square kilometers has now been made into a national park by the Australian government in recognition of the island's unique and threatened wildlife. Although there's great potential for tourism on the island, the most significant economic activity is currently mining, as there's a good supply of phosphates in the local rock. The role of the national park is therefore to protect the wildlife rather than to attract visitors. Like other remote islands, Christmas Island has a number of unique and endangered species. Some of which are already extinct or under threat of extinction. Two rodent species are known to have died out, as has one species of bat, and a number of reptile and bird species are seriously threatened. The best known of all the island's creatures, however, are its land crabs, which are found in large numbers and which are essential to the island's ecology. And for an 18-day period each year. One of the island's fourteen crab species, the red crab, becomes the center of widespread attention as it makes its spectacular migration to the sea to breed. More about that in a moment. Aware of the need to do more to protect the fragile ecosystem on Christmas Island, the Australian government has commissioned a report from the expert working group it has set up to investigate the problem. Previous inquiries by government-appointed committees did lead to the setting up of the national park, so there is much to hope for. Before you hear the rest of the lecture, you have some time to look at questions thirty-six to forty. Now listen, and answer questions thirty-six to forty. So, back to the red crab, which has attracted quite a bit of media attention in recent years. The red crab is found all over Christmas Island, and is vital to its ecosystem. Although they do sometimes eat snails and other smaller creatures, the crab's diet is largely made up of leaves. With the addition of flowers and seedlings when these are available, their droppings then provide an important fertilizer for the island's soil. Also, by turning over the soil when digging the holes called burrows where they live, the crabs help the propagation of plant species. Although you might think that an animal that goes in for mass migration would be quite sociable by nature, each red crab. Actually, spends most of the year living alone in its burrow, and so is actually quite solitary. Each crab constructs a burrow in the earth, with one chamber inside and one tunnel entrance, and stays there most of the time, especially during the dry season. The crabs are more active in the rainy season, and that's also when the famous migration occurs. It isn't the rain. That triggers the migration, however, so much as the phase of the moon and the state of the tides. Trying to predict when the migration will occur is quite difficult, as it can be as early as October or as late as December, depending on the year. Although it's usually sometime in November, in fact. And when it comes, the migration is quite spectacular, with literally millions of crabs heading for the seashore at the same time. Conservationists do their best to limit the number of road casualties among the crabs by closing certain roads, encouraging car sharing, and other measures to reduce traffic. Even constructing bridges for the crabs at certain key points. So before I go on to the migration.
That is the end of the test.